Okay, Seth on Windows. So, my name is Alessandro Pilotti, uh, CUR Club Based Solutions. Um, one of the things we did uh, recently was to port uh, Seth on Windows. Um, why did we do that? The, the main idea is that we needed uh, um, Ceph working on Windows servers, because Ceph is, of course, one of the most popular distributed you know, open source uh, storage solutions, and Windows Server has still a pretty large uh, market share, especially in the enterprise. Um, iSky is a gateway. Performance was always like a big bottleneck, you know, a source of complaints from, uh, from many people, and that's actually where the rationale for, for this work came from. Um, it's actually an idea that we were floating around since a while, and um, it actually came to be um, when we did the work together with Suze. Okay, Suze, uh, we had a fantastic partnership with them, and uh, and uh, we managed to to pull this project off. Okay. Um, we had a set of architectural goals, so our main purpose uh, typically when, when we work uh, in, uh, in bringing together Windows and Linux, uh, which is something that we do regularly as a company, so if you, have, uh, if you know the, the history of cloud base, you know, we did this before already with OpenV Switch, you know, we did it before with Hyper-V and OpenStack. Um, we live between these two worlds in the end, you know, in, 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 in the enterprise space, between uh, uh, the Linux side of things and the Windows side of things. So in the moment in which we bring them together, we want to make sure that uh, the, the experience can be seamless for people coming from the Linux background on the Windows world and has to be seamless also for people from the Windows world in the moment in which they start using tools, uh, uh, um, uh, tooling which is basically, which was born for, uh, for, for, um, uh, from, from a Linux environment. Okay? So we wanted the user experience on Windows to be as close uh, as the Linux one as possible. We had it, uh, we, it had to integrate in the best possible way in the Wisdom ecosystem. And as, as I mentioned already before, I had to outperform the iSCSI gateway and get uh, as close as possible to the, uh, to the Linux native performance. And spoiler alert, we actually managed to outperform Linux even uh, in this side, at least in the test that we did. Had to be secure, of course, right? So we live in a world in which we cannot uh, omit that part. So security was a primary goal here. And it had to have support for all the modern uh, Windows Server OS, so we support 2016, 19, 22, and uh, Windows 10 and 11 for developing use cases. Um, one of the non-goals was to port OSD to Windows, so, we are, so the, the idea was not to make, uh, at least for the time being, is not to make um, uh, Ceph running on Windows independently from, uh, from OSD running on, 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 on Linux itself, but the goal is to integrate it in an environment where both can live together. Here's an idea of the architecture. Um, it was a, a challenging work from a, from, a, from a technological standpoint, so we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, it um, you know, the, the user space side of things, usually when we port projects from, from Linux to Windows, can, can usually be adapted really well, but in this case, we had to write something completely different, you know, from, uh, from the kernel side, because of course the, the Linux kernel and the Windows kernels work in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way. So we wrote a kernel driver, which is called WNDB, that I will um, explain a little bit better in a bit. And on top of that, in the user space, we ported uh, LibreDB and Librados, uh, and we added a bunch of additional components. And then those things are then connecting directly to, uh, to SD, which lives on the, on, on the Linux side. Uh, just one question. How many of you already tried um, Ceph on Windows? Okay. How many of you are planning to do so? Okay, very good. Excellent. Okay. So, as I was uh, mentioning, we ported the LibreDB and Librados, and in general, the CLI surface, so the command line interface. Um, the RBD mappings are managed by the RBD WMBD uh, commands, which also can be invoked directly with RBD. So, RBD device map, unmap, and device list, okay? So, as you can see, it's a very familiar uh, command line interface. Um, in Windows, we have uh, services instead of daemons. So what you stuff that normally you will do, for example, with system D on Linux, here you do it with Windows services because, uh, of course, once you create a mapping, most probably you want it to survive you know, when you reboot. 
So we have a Windows service which actually handles that. And as I mentioned before, the, the RBD um, command line interface works in a, in a very similar way. Now, the, the core of the project is this Windows kernel driver called WMBD. Um, for the um, technical minded about you, it's a Windows kernel driver which implements a, a win virtual store port mini port. Okay? So think about it like, like you will see, I don't know, other uh, network storage drivers on, uh, on, on Windows itself. Um, how did we implement it? We implemented it uh, with um, some design um, architectural choices in mind. One of them was to make sure it could work uh, um, with MBD via TCP IP in a way in which it can be compatible with any Linux MBD server. Of course, this is not the most performant use case, but it's very useful, for example, for testing or to expand it also beyond the Ceph realm, okay? So you could use it for doing any type of uh, network-oriented storage, right? And, uh, and that was one of the goals we had in mind. That's why it's called WMBD and it's called not like, I don't know, Windows Ceph driver or something like this. Um, or uh, there is also a local user space kernel channel which is meant to be extremely fast and performant, okay? So in that case, uh, uh, um, it, it's what is, of course, the, the preferred interface, and that's what we used, of course, to, to, to have the maximum performance we can achieve out of this. License-wise, it's, of course, open source, so we are a company which uh, lives in open source, breathes open source, and, of course, whatever we do tends to be open source first, so that, that's where it comes from. And originally it was on GitHub cloud-based WMBD, and now it's part of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Ceph org on, on, uh, on, uh, on GitHub. So you find it on github.com Ceph WMBD, okay? Uh, we work together with the Ceph Foundation, and uh, so we're sponsored with the Ceph Foundation, we work together with them, and currently we're running a CI. So any changes that happen in Ceph gets actually tested, you know, also on Windows, which is very important, of course, moving forward with, with the project. How do you configure this? Well, exactly like you will configure it on, uh, on, uh, on Linux. So you have a bunch of configuration files. Uh, you know, the ones that on Linux you will put on uh, etc self. On Windows, they go in a different location, which is program data self. Okay, so for example, C, program data, self is where you put it. I will show you in the demo. What do you put there? Self.com, keyring files, and things like this, okay? So the, the typical use case is like, uh, okay, you're adding some Windows nodes, you just create a directory, copy over the file from Linux, uh, install it from the installer I will show you in a bit, and that's pretty much it. So very simple, user-friendly, and everything. Um, beside RBD, so RBD, of course, was our primary use case. The next thing we wanted to do was also to port CFFS. Okay. How many of you guys are using CFFS? Cool. Okay. So CFFS is something that we wanted to have on Windows, and, and the nice thing is that you can write files on both of them, and it works like magic because, you know, you don't have to care what type of uh, uh, file system you have and everything. It just works, you know? No problem in knowing if it's XT4 or NTFS. It just works. Um, how does it work? You know, normally on, on, on Linux, this type of things use um, Fuse, now which is not available on, on Windows. On Windows, which is something similar, uh, which is called Docany. It's again another open source project that we, we leveraged here. Um, I will show you also during the demo how this works. It's, it's an evolution of the previous Ceph Doc and community work, you know, but of course there is a lot of changes that we did in the process. Okay? Okay, Windows being Windows, you install things not with app, you know, apt install, apt install, or you install and everything. You need MSI installers. So that's what we did. We implemented also an installer. You know, I mentioned at the beginning that we wanted to be to things to be familiar for both uh, uh, Windows, you know, DevOps and sysadmins and Linux ones. So on the Windows side, you have a traditional MSI package that you can either just install, you know, with a double click, next, 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 and everything. Or you can also automate it uh, with whatever automationing tooling you, you might want to use, you know, uh, Ansible or whatever else you might prefer. Also, the installer itself is open source. There are continuous builds available, so anytime some changes happen uh, in WMBD or in upstream chef and everything, new releases are 
released. <laughs> and uh, we have actually at the moment two different ones, Pacific one and Quincy ones. Um, and it's available on that link over there. Okay? It's going to be moved uh, soon, I think, also on, on, on the Ceph Foundation pages. So that's the process that we're doing. Uh, last but not least, you know, when you live on the, in the Windows Server world, um, very often you need to address also virtualization. So the Hyper-V is a fantastic hypervisor, uh, which comes with, with Windows. So we wanted to make sure that also you could uh, uh, not only access RBD images from, uh, uh, from virtual machines running on Hyper-V, but we wanted also to make sure you can also boot uh, VMs directly off RBD images. So this is an example you can see there, you know, just create a VM in PowerShell in this case, add the disk drive, start the VM, it just works, you know? So you will see a demo. It's actually very nice to see how, it, how it, the whole thing works. Performance was a, a, a key aspect in all this. Um, why? Because uh, it doesn't really make sense to do this work if it was performing uh, less uh, worse, let's say, than, than the IceCast gateway, no? Okay, the IceCast gateway has two problems. One is the um, performance, and the second one is could be a single point of failure in your organization, right? Um, we had to address both of them, but without addressing also the performance, it didn't really make much sense. So when we created the architecture for this, we were very, very keen to, to maximize, you know, and avoid uh, every possible bottlenecks that we could identify. So not only we, we did that, but we managed also to outperform RBD, MBD, and KRBD on, on Linux in our test for a series of reasons that I can discuss with you, but let's say are um, due to the fact that, of course, we, we came afterwards, we could see what type of bottlenecks were available on Linux, and we could avoid that, especially on the traded side of things. Um, WMBD, as I mentioned before, implement, is implemented actually with the VSR control, okay? So it's something that is the fastest way in which we could have a, a user space to kernel communication channel. Uh, we had a very improved I.O. worker trace allocation, you know, compared to um, other designs that we were looking at before. And um, we published also a bunch of blog posts. Again, when, when we do performance-related uh, research, you know, in blog posts, we publish not only our results, but the entire methodology, because otherwise, you know, okay, we did this work, of course, we did the project, somebody might say, hey, you guys did the project, it's obviously faster than the other guys. So I said, okay, now, here's the project, we open source all the tooling, we open source in all the scripts we use, uh, please run it yourself. If you find the inconsistent results, please get back and let us know. But so far, the feedback we had was extremely positive, so. Okay. All right, time for the demo. You know, it's, it's a very short session, so we have only another few minutes for the demo, and then I will have, uh, we will have time for a few for questions. Okay, demo. Okay, why don't I see it over there? Maybe I have to stop this. Yep, there we go. Okay, so this is just a Windows machine. So I already downloaded the SF MSI. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually to install it. You start it like any other installer. Again, you can also automate it, right? So MSI exec, so it's the same automation rules you do with any Windows installer. So if you need to use it with Ansible or whatever rules you might have, uh, it will just work. As you can see, it's LGPL. You can also install just the self CLI if you want, but it doesn't really make much sense for our demo. So we installed both the CLI and the Windows driver. And that's pretty much it. Okay. The driver is signed by cloud-based solutions, so I accept it. That's it. I'm going to do a reboot because I had a previous version of the driver installed. Okay, so we have a, we have a clean thing. Normally, if you start fresh, you don't need to do that. So just like quick time for, for rebooting.
Okay, we are back. Actually, we'll start another one of these ones. So what I have here, um, basically I will keep uh, two common prompts. In one of them, I SSH into um, um, a Linux machine, which is of course connected to my, uh, to my Ceph cluster, right? And on the other one, I will have the Windows side, so you can see actually both things at once. So I will show you that the, the commands have the work on both sides. All right. So for example, let's do an RBD list. So you can see, I'm, I have a, a already an image which uh, is called Hyper-V1, which is already created for one of the next demos, which is obviously about Hyper-V. What I'm going to do now is to create uh, a, a new mapping, sorry, a new image. I do it on the Windows side, so you see this, this common prompt on the right is Windows, so if I repeat here the RBD list, uh, voila, you know? So same identical experience, just works the same. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Next. Now we do the mapping. Okay. So in the moment in which I map it, Windows will discover that there is a new disk, okay? Uh, it tells me, of course, it's an empty image. So it's an empty disk, right? So I have to initialize it. And this is it. So now I, here I have it here. I can create a volume. It's 10 gigabytes, as you can see. NTFS, whatever. And that's it. So I have my volume there on Windows. Perfectly visible. I can unmap it later and uh, I, I can treat it exactly any, like any other disk that I have on Windows, okay? So very, very simple and everything. Um, among the, f the changes that we are working on and will be available also at some point, we will add also support for clustering, especially CSV volumes and things like this. So at that point, it will be completely transparent independently of the fact that it uses Ceph as a backend, okay? But again, the goal was to make sure that it was seamlessly integrated in the Windows ecosystem, which is what we did. Okay. The RBD, WMBD command can also be used for listing. And uh, here you can see my mapping. Open. You can see the mapping over here. If I reboot the machine, this mapping is persistent, so it will automatically be reinstated in the moment when the machine restarts. I can also do uh, transient ones. Maybe I might need it for testing and stuff like that, but in the majority of the use cases, you will want persistent ones. Good. So that's the first demo. Now, let's talk CephFS. So CephFS volume LS, right? So on, on the Linux side, I don't have any. Creating one. So here it is. Now on the Linux side, I'm going to mount it. And we want to create a simple file inside of it. You know, something cheesy and simple like, you know, hello from Linux and whatnot. Just, I wanted just to put a file in there, you know, because I wanted to show you how you see it from, uh, from the Windows side. Now let's go on the other side. So this command here mounted it in, uh, in, uh, in Windows. So if I go back here. You see this new Ceph X, because I told it to mount it with the X letter. So if I open it, voila, I see my file, no? With all its content and everything. Now I can create a file here. C 
similar in Hello from Windows. And if I go on the Linux side, voila, there is the other file. Okay. So this is again very useful to bridge the gap between the Windows and the Linux worlds, right? Good. So that was demo number two. We have another one, which is about Hyper-V. So um, I skipped already a part. Uh, if you do, um, um, if you do an RBD list, there is already a Hyper-V one um, uh, image. How did I create it? I simply converted uh, with QMMG. I converted in this case uh, um, um, a Linux. Um, a Linux image, which would be uh, an OpenSUSE, actually. So a QCOW2, I converted it directly in, a, in, a, in, a, in an RBD image, OK? I could do it also live, but it takes like a few minutes to do all the work. It doesn't really make sense to, to stay here <laughs> and have you wait for that. So it's already done. And what is the purpose of this? The purpose is that I'm going to mount it on the other side. to map it more exactly. So I can actually terminate the, the mapping. So now it's mounted. If I go on my disk manager, and I refresh it, here I have it, you know, disk two. You see, unlike the previous volume, which was empty, this one already contains something. You see all the partitions, of course, of my Linux machine. In order to use it in Hyper-V, since I have the rule uh, to automatically mount any, any external um, uh, disk, I have to put it offline, which is what I'm doing here. And now I can just create a VM. Now, this is an empty VM, obviously, without anything. And here is the, the simple trick that will add. Uh, you see, I'm just telling, telling Hyper-V, in this case, to, to, uh, to um, attach a disk that will automatically go and pass through on that particular disk that we mounted, OK? So fully transparent. So if I do a start VM, here it is. And here is my Linux machine booting, my OpenSUSE machine. And voila, just works, no? Because we don't have to wait it to boot and everything. The important thing, as you can see, all the I.O. is actually happening you know, to RBD in this case. So it goes through the driver, it goes through you know, libRBD and everything, it goes outside, and it's actually served for the Ceph cluster, which is running somewhere on, on, on a Linux cluster. Good. OK, that closes the demo. We have exactly two minutes left. So quickly resuming the presentation. OK, some information about uh, where to get the data. You can find us, of course, in the Ceph community. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, we have a boot here, cloud-based boot. If you have any questions, please come over there. Any questions now? Is there any difference between RBD and global? Uh, no, it's actually the, the same command which goes across the wrapper. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, just a wrapper, yes. You also mentioned optimization for uh, yeah. uh, the ESO or HPC Linux with like, how do you do the optimization for it yeah. in Windows? Yeah, correct. It's, it's a bit of a long explanation. I think it's better if we, if we talk about this in the boot. But it's largely how threads are used and implemented. So we, we expanded and we used as much as possible, let's say, multiple CPU threads uh, to be able to achieve that. You know? 
uh, especially also in the user space to kernel communication and things like this, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Right, any other question? Uh, we tasted mostly active passive in our use cases, but uh, um, um, it, 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 let's say from the iSCSI perspective, uh, um, uh, it will outperform also the active active. So we can perform tests also on that side if needed. So it's not just a little passive. Correct, yeah. yeah. Basically, you skip an entire layer at that point. So it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, 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 it's more performant by, by design in the end. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, yeah, 2016 is the first we support. So 16, uh, 19, 22, and of course uh, for development use cases, so let's say Windows 10 and 11, right? So, but let's say technology-wise, it works on all those platforms, right? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. One more question. Sorry. Yeah. Do you have any customers using Spectrum or able to show this to users? Uh, we have uh, ma many, many users because you know it's open source, right? And so we don't have telemetry coming back and everything. But we we got many many companies that reach back either for thanking or for expressing uh, questions or. Uh, 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 or um, expressing, asking questions like about the future roadmap and everything. So I know that there are many clusters being used over there. Uh, the funny thing about working open source is to do it a lot of times is that the general uh, point of view is that when people don't complain, it makes it works well, you know? <laughs> because they very rarely come and say, oh, it works great, you know? They usually come and say, oh, you know, this thing doesn't work, you know? So that's the, and actually I can't wait hopefully to be at Cephalocon uh, and um, well, I will do another, another presentation and, uh, and hopefully hear more uh, from the community over there. Okay. okay, thank you very much, guys. If you have any more questions, I will be at work. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.